Good morning, everyone. We'll wait for a few more folks to join us. We can see the numbers coming in. That's fantastic. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dana Moore. I'm the Director of Broker Relations at North San Diego County Realtors. We have a great class for you today. We'll give it one more minute. It's 10.01. And thank you all for joining us. Happy Tuesday. <clears throat> I hope everybody's staying cool in this, this humid weather that we have. All right. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm Dana Moore, your Director of Broker Relations. Uh, welcome to today's ZipForm training webinar presented to you by the North San Diego County Realtors. Today's presenter, CAR ZipForm trainer Jackson Boudelaire, will show you how to best utilize ZipForm where you can get the most out of your free member benefit. And before we get started, I wanted to share some really big news. We're opening a new location right off the 15. Tomorrow, Wednesday, July 28th, we're opening our newest location in Rancho Bernardo to help drive your business. So stop by for the grand opening with a ribbon cutting ceremony starting at 9 a.m. and free professional headshots from 10 a.m. until 12 p.m. Join us for new member discounts, giveaways, and light refreshments. You'll find us at 16766 Bernardo Center Drive, and I hope to see you there uh, tomorrow. And without further ado, here is your presenter, Jackson Boudelaire. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. All right, so let's jump right into my slides. I think that uh, someone needs to enable me to share my screen. Let's see if Shirley, you can help Jackson share his screen. There we go, perfect. All right, so let's talk about transactions, ZipForm edition. Today we're gonna to be talking about preparing, sharing and signing documents. My name is Jackson Baudelaire, as I have been graciously uh, in, uh, intro introduced. I'm a transaction and training supervisor at the California Association of Realtors. I was a realtor myself for about 10 years, uh, specialized in residential real estate for the first half of my career, then moved into commercial real estate, selling apartment buildings and the like, uh, five units and up. Love real estate, it's a fantastic career, but I also love teaching, I love education and teaching realtors like yourselves how to be more confident and efficient and competent in this ZipForm software is very, very important. This is where we get our forms. This is where we manage our transactions. And in general, you need to know how to use ZipForm to do business. And it's uh, wonderful webinars like this provided by your association that make that possible. Today, we're gonna to be talking about folders and organization. We're gonna talk about email to transaction, digital signatures and using Zip community. These are all tools that are gonna help you stay paperless. I know that we're opening, things are opening back up. We're not quite as remote as we have been in the last 19 months, but um, we're definitely still going to stay paperless as much as possible. Not just because we wanna conserve paper, but just because it's a lot easier. Um, there are some other training resources that are available to you. If you like watching videos on how to do things, Lone Wolf has a YouTube channel with lots of general zip form training on there. They have their own webinars, like the one we're on right now, that are provided by Lone Wolf. Just remember that Lone Wolf is a national company. They're not based in California. They're not specific to California. If you want a specific California webinar, you can go to car.org, sign up for one of our webinars. We do five to seven webinars every month, ranging from basics, advanced signatures. We do zip for mobile, a specific one. We do commercial and property management. Um, a lot of great resources. If you go to this page where you can sign up for webinars, below that there's a, a video player that has all of our archived webinars. It's myself or my associate Ed. Uh, we are we've been trainers at, at CAR for a number of years, and we know Zip like the back of our hand. So definitely check out one of our webinars. 
There's also phone support with Lone Wolf that you can go to uh, their website or you can call in 24 hours a day, business uh, during the week. We have the customer contact center at CAR as well. That's definitely, that's one of your member benefits. And I highly suggest that you use it. The legal hotline is there, membership, zip form help. If they can't help you at the contact center, they're going to send it up to me or Ed. And we are definitely here to help you. Okay. So let's jump into zip and talk about our agenda. Okay. We're going to be talking about folders and organization and really where folders and organization really shine are inside of templates. So templates are folders of documents, information that we pre-populate so that when we start our new transaction, we're already two steps, three steps ahead. So for example, I have a listing template here. Now, when you take a listing, that's all but a guarantee of a payday, right? Especially in this market. So we want to make sure that we are as organized as possible right off the bat, okay? So my listing template, I have set to automatically apply. So anytime that I start a residential listing transaction, this template is set to automatically apply, which is very, very helpful, okay? So I have a good amount of organization here. I have a listing document folder. Inside that folder, I have a cover sheet. I have my listing agreement, obviously. And then I have a few placeholders. Now, what is a placeholder? You might not know. A placeholder is a visual reminder of something that I want to add at a later date. So you can see here that I have a list of repairs and a list of providers. And what do I mean by that? So I, for the list of repairs, I don't want TDS, SPQ level list of repairs. I want general. The house that, that, that I'm going to be listing is in a tract of houses that were built in the 70s that all they're all two and three bedroom houses, right? Your house has a very large second story addition on it. What year did that happen? I, I want general knowledge about the property because I'm going to get sign calls. I'm going to have open houses. Other agents are going to call me. And I want to be as knowledgeable and educated about this property as possible. This is also going to help when you're writing your description or your agent remarks on the MLS. And then for the list of providers, Obviously, I want to know who they have for you know TV, internet, cable, all that. But I want to know who's their gardener? Who cleans the pool? Do they have a tree trimmer? There's a huge magnolia tree in the front of their house. Do they have a tree trimmer or does the city take care of that? I want to know everything about that property in kind of bullet, you know, bullet points, the, the broad strokes of it, okay? And this is also going to help your sellers kind of jog their memory for when they do fill out the TDS and SBQ. It's going to help, it's going to help both of you. And it's going to make sure that you are the most knowledgeable person in the room at, at the open house. Okay. I also have a, a spot for the MLS printout. Now this is a transaction management system. Zip form is not just where you get your forms. It's where you do everything in your transaction. So we want to make sure that we have every document in our transaction. Now to create a placeholder, we can go up to add document here. And the, fir and the first thing we have is browse for a document that's looking on your computer for a file. But the second one is creating a placeholder. Easy as that. You name it, you tell the system if it's required or not, hit okay. And it's gonna have this empty null spot for a document. The other folders I have, I have a folder for offers because obviously we're gonna get what, 30, 40 offers on a property. I have a folder for closing documents and I have a photo, or sorry, a folder for photos. Now, inside of my offers, I also have a folder for counter offers. This is the level of organization that makes the most sense to me. This is this worked for me in practice as a, as a realtor. And this is kind of in contrast to my purchase template. Now, my, my we write a lot of offers, especially in this market, right? So the, my purchase template is pretty sparse. I have a spot for the pre-approval, a spot for the proof of funds. I have a cover sheet. I have the RPA, and then I have a couple supporting um, forms that are not necessarily going to be sent with the offer. The summary probably will, but the finance worksheet won't. So you see, I don't have any folders. There's not a lot of organization here because I want what works for me. Again, this is, I'm not telling you how to do your transactions, but what worked for me was to have the least amount, least common denominator here. This is exactly what I need to start an offer every time. It's general. And that's what we want our templates to do. 
Now I also have a short checklist inside of my purchase template. Same for the listing template, my proof of funds, my pre-approval. So those two placeholders that I want to fill, I have a spot, I have a task so that when, when I get those done, I can mark them as completed. Just helps me. The reason why I do this, I have due dates on here too. So on the date of the offer and on the date of the contract, which are generally the same date, these are due. The reason why I do that is because anything that has a due date, you're going to get an email and a notification in app that you have a task that's due two days prior to the due date and also two days after it's overdue. So this, these due dates are going to show up on my dashboard, on my tasks that are due this week. As soon as I start this offer and I put, it, I put these dates in there, there, it's going to show up on my dashboard. And that's helpful to me. I'm a visual person. I like to see exactly what I'm missing or see what I need to fill in. And having these placeholders reminds me, oh, look, I haven't, I haven't gotten that pre-approval yet. I need to get that pre-approval. Okay. Someone says I'm going too fast. I'll slow down a little bit. It's the morning I had my coffee. All right. So we talked about folders and organization. Now let's apply our purchase template to an actual transaction so that we can see the mechanics of everything going through. So I'm going to start a new transaction and this one is going to be a purchase. Now I selected purchase. And as soon as I select residential, my awesome purchase template, the one that we were just looking at, automatically applied. Now to get the address and all the property information in there, I'm going to use MLS Connect. And today I'm going to be using Claw. I know you guys don't use Claw, but I'm using Claw for today. Again, mechanics are exactly the same. I'm going to grab the listing ID that I want to use, and I'm going to drop it in here. I want to include the property photo as well. I'm going to click Find. And it's going to scour the internet for information about this property. So this property on Melbourne Glen in Escondido, I, it brought in the address, city, state, zip. It brought in the listing price, 940000 It brought in the, the date that it was listed. And it's also going to bring in the other agent's information. And that's pretty helpful to me. I'm going to grab the property address here. And then we're going to hit save. So this is going to open a new transaction. And it's also going to bring in the information from the MLS about this property. So, so far, what have I done? I started a new transaction. I told it what kind of transaction. And I brought in the MLS data for this, for this property. Pretty good, right? Now, because it applied my template, my cover sheet already has my information in there. No buyers, no sellers, but it has the property information. And it's got my information and it's got the other agent's information. It's pretty helpful, right? Now, in my parties, I have the listing agent and myself, but I need a buyer, right? So I'm going to choose my from my address book. So again, when you hover over the buyer spot right here, we have our address book come up. And I'm going to search my address book. And today, as always, we're going to use my good buddy, Ricardo. He's my go to buyer. I have all of his information in here. Let's save. And now we have Ricardo and the listing agent and the selling agent. Perfect. Now one thing about and we're going to kind of jump forward a little bit. We talk, we were going to talk about zip community. Now zip community if you're not familiar with it is a way for you to share documents and collaborate with your client. And if you see this little icon here, it's these three people. We have that same icon in the corner of each one of these parties. We are able to create a collaboration with any party in our transaction. And so right now I'm going to, I'm going to set up that collaboration right off the bat because my client wants to be involved in this transaction. Okay. So I'm going to click on the share button here and it's going to ask me, what do you want to share and what privileges do you want them to have? Let's do that. So at this point, I do not want my client to edit anything, but I do want them to be able to upload. And this is going to give them a secure encrypted portal and method to upload their proof of funds, their bank statement, things like that. Things that are sensitive that we don't want to go through email because email is not secure whatsoever. Uh, for the stop sharing date, this is going to be set automatically to 30 days. 
I like to use this after the close to provide my clients again with a secure and encrypted portal to get all of those documents from the transaction. Because as we get things signed, obviously your client gets a copy of it, but I'm not expecting my client to keep everything in an organized fashion for everything that they signed. That, that's our job. We have a duty to provide our client with a file after the fact. We don't have to, obviously, but you should. It's good, good, business, good business practice. So this is going to give them, I'm going to turn off the stop sharing date because I will choose when to stop sharing. And at this point, our transaction is going to be retained for seven years from today, seven years. So our client is going to have access for seven years to this transaction, far, far longer than the DRE is requiring you or obligating you to hold on to that transaction. So what are we going to share with them? At this point, I'm going to share the RPA. Nothing has really been filled out on that RPA, but as we fill it out, they will have access to see the RPA. I'm going to click save and send. It's got some boilerplate information and I'm going to hit send. And my client is going to receive an email from me inviting them to collaborate on this transaction. So if they have never used Zip Community before, they will be able to create an account at this point. So if they create an account, because they clicked on that deep link, this link in their email, if they click create an account, look at this. It already knows their name. It already knows that they're the buyer. It's going to suggest their username. It already knows their email. So really the only thing they have to do is create a password. It's pretty painless. There's really not a lot to it. Okay. My client in particular has already used this before. So they're going to sign in as Ricky Rick. And as they sign in, they're going to see, see he's used it before, his picture's in here. They're going to see the information about the property. They have a little dashboard and they have a calendar with all of the dates. So we can see that the date of the listing was today. This is our, I'm sorry, not today. It was the 22nd and this is today. As we add dates to the transaction, they will show up on the calendar. So we can include our client on things. If we set a due date for the contingency removal, the loan contingency, we put in our inspection dates, our appraisal dates, our client has a calendar that they can see everything that's going on. And this is behind a, a username and password, secure. They can email us from here. They can call us from here. And then they also have access to documents. So they can view the RPA, even though we haven't filled anything out on it yet. They can view the RPA as a PDF and... They can print it, they can download it, they can do whatever they need to do. So as of right now, because I used a template, uh, some of this is filled out. You know, there's a couple of check boxes in here. I don't have a price yet. I have 45 days in here, but I my template had a few things, had a few boxes checked and a few numbers filled in. So that's all they're really going to see right now. But they do have this add document button, and that's going to allow them to browse their computer for a document. In this case, they're going to be uploading their proof of funds or their pre-approval and their proof of funds. Let's upload those. So now there are these two PDFs that were added. If we go back to our transaction, go to our documents, look at that. There they are. We gave them secure encrypted access on a very, very permission-based level, okay? We choose the permissions, we choose what to share, and we can revoke that at any point. So now that I have my pre-approval, I can click and drag it onto my placeholder, or I can click right on my placeholder and say, I wanna fill it with an existing document because it's already in the transaction. Choose my proof of funds. And now I have filled my placeholder. And remember, I had a checklist on there too. So I haven't put in a date yet, but this is complete. And so is this, okay? Off to a good start. Not much has happened so far. Our client was provided access to the form. Our client uploaded their proof of funds and their pre-approval. We're off to a real good start, okay? So let's talk a little bit about email to transaction. That was our second agenda item. So there is inside of each transaction, a unique email that will allow documents and communications to be saved in the transaction. So for example, if you're sitting at lunch 
you get, a, get an email from the escrow saying, oh, with a, an escrow amendment, something that needs to be signed. You're sitting at lunch, maybe you're with a client, maybe you're with another colleague, and you don't really have time to act upon it at that moment. No problem. You can forward it onto the transaction. And then when you get back to, the, to your desk, back to your computer, it'll be there. So we click on email to transaction on the summary tab of the transaction. This is our email right here. And if you notice this first set of numbers, 80279, this is our transaction ID. So it's our transaction ID, a unique identifier at docs.ziplogics.com. You in no way need to remember that. In practice, I would save this email address in my phone as a contact, maybe name it after the address of the property, whatever you need to do. I would save it in my Outlook contacts as well. So that anywhere I was on my computer or on my phone, I could forward this, any communication onto the transaction. Now, in a perfect world, you would tell all the parties in the transaction to please CC this email address on all correspondence with me. Are they going to do it every time? Of course not. But that's okay. If you, if you get an email that doesn't have uh, that this CC, just forward it onto the transaction. So I'm going to copy this email address and, and my client is going to send me a, an email. We're going to compose an email. He's going to send it to me. He's going to CC the transaction. He's going to say, let's talk. What can't type today? Let's talk about the deal. We're going to drop some Latin in there just for a little bit of filler. And then he's going to attach. He has, he actually has an updated pre-approval. So he's going to attach that. So we have an email going to me, the agent from my client. They're CCing the transaction. Let's talk about the deal. They have a subject line. We have a, we have a body of the email and then we have an attachment and we'll click send. So that's going to take a moment to get into our system for the system to receive it. But in the meantime, let's talk about one of the other features similar to email to transaction. We have fax cover sheet. Okay. So your client, everyone, some clients are going to say, I don't have a scanner. I need to fax this to you. Great. We have a way to receive faxes into zip and it's paperless on our, on our end, at least. This is a fax cover sheet. This is the cover sheet that needs to uh, be the front, obviously, of the, of the packet, whatever they're faxing us. This is a barcode. Anything sent with this cover sheet, with this barcode, is going to go into this transaction. So they will fill out, obviously, the, who it's from, number of pages, all that stuff. This isn't really necessary, but the number of pages is nice so that you know that you receive the entire fax. Anything sent with this fax cover sheet is going to end up in the transaction in its own folder called inbox. It's going to be one big PDF, obviously, and you can split that PDF as you need it in inside of Zip. So this works very much the same way as email to transaction. It's a digital way to re receive documents and communication directly into your transaction. Pretty easy. So now when you get a, an attachment, to in an email, you don't have to download it, save it, upload it into your transaction. You can just forward it onto the transaction. And the good thing about that is when you use the email to transaction, you're not only getting the attachment, you're also getting the correspondence. So the body of the email is going to be its own PDF, time and date stamped, cannot be edited. And you're also going to receive the attachment as a PDF to do whatever you need to with in the transaction. Okay. So these are very powerful tools that are, in my opinion, in my experience, pretty underutilized. Okay. We have a very, very effective way to get things into our transaction without having to download them to our computer or to our device, especially if you're on your phone. You know, it's not super easy to download a file on your phone and then upload it into your transaction. You don't have to deal with it. You can just forward it on. Easy as that. I'm harping on that because I think it's a really fantastic tool. Okay. So while we're waiting for that email to come in, let's, let's fill in our RPA and then go and then get it signed. Okay. So I'm going to open up my RPA. Okay. So we have 
we had a couple check boxes that we put that we used our uh, template to fill in. And now we have our first page of our RPA. Let's fill in some details here. So the date of the offer, it's gonna to be today. Our price, we were at 940. So we're going to be uh, pretty aggressive. We're gonna go 962, 500, okay? We already checked our boxes. We have our listing agent in here. And now we get to the initial deposit. Now I like to do 3%. I also don't like to do math if I don't have to. So I have a, a document for that. I have a form for that. It's called the RPA financing worksheet, the RPAWS, RPAWS. So I'm gonna open up that RPAWS. We have our price. We have our balance of, balance of purchase price. And then, oh, look at this my initial deposit, I have 3%. It did the math for me. Isn't that fantastic? Okay, I also, I'm not doing it an additional deposit, but we are putting 25% down. And it's gonna do that math for me as well. So now when we go back to our RPA, we will see that those numbers are now reflected on our RPA, our initial deposit and our first loan. Now, if we need to make changes to the price and we need to do those on the finance worksheet in order for them to calculate correctly, okay? So from this point forward, before we get the offer signed, if we need to make changes to the price, we're gonna do that on the finance worksheet, okay? I already have a couple check boxes in here, our verification of funds, because we have our, pre, our uh, proof of funds, we have our pre-approval, so our letters attached, we shortened our contingencies a bit. Um, but maybe we have, maybe on the finance terms, we have a lot to say. Maybe we have something very specific from the lender that we wanna include in our offer. And we really, we only have two, less than two lines to put that in, but that's okay. I'm gonna drop, a lot of text in here, okay? I'm gonna throw a bunch of text in there. You can see that we have multiple lines of text. So what happens to all that text? Is it getting truncated? Is it getting cut off? No, actually it's not, which is pretty fantastic. If we preview our form, get a PDF preview of it, we will see that what happens when you, and again, I'm gonna be hinting towards this, when you overflow a text field, you get what's called the text overflow addendum automatically. You didn't have to add it. All you had to do was overflow that field. And, and your entire response is shown with the signature block. This, this is part of the contract now. So if we go to that page of the RPA, we see that on the bottom here, it says C text overflow addendum, CAR form TOA paragraph one. This works on the other terms as well. Maybe we have even more to say. Hit our preview here. And now our 19 page document, might be 20 at this point, because we put a lot of text in there. Nope, still 19. But it's gonna show paragraph one, RPA additional financing terms, paragraph two, RPA other terms. All of our text is in there. So this is an automatic thing. The, the system is looking out for you. They don't want you to have to abbreviate yourself too much. Again, do you want to write a novel in the other terms? Probably not, but you can, if you really have a lot to say, you can definitely do that. So anywhere, any, per, I, I would say 99.9% .9 of the forms in the car library, if there's an extended text field, you can overflow it and a TOA will automatically attach. If you overflow the overflow, it's just going to keep adding TOAs to the, to the document. Okay. So now that we have this filled out, okay, we're going to jump ahead to get it signed. I am going to e-sign this and maybe my client wants to review it first. That's okay. If they, they can log in to their zip community account, they can open up the RPA at this point before they've even signed it. And it's going to pull up that 19 page preview of the form. They can see the price and the initial deposit, the loan. They're going to see as well the 
see the TOA, that TOA flows over. They can see everything that we've done because we have collaborated. We've given our clients a portal into our transaction. We are, we're, we're working out of the same transaction folder. They just have very limited access to what they can do and what they can see. And we choose all those, those details. Okay. So I'm going to click e-sign. We're going to use digital link 2.0. Remember digital link 1.0 is going away um, in September. So at this point, I would highly recommend that you start using digital link 2.0 if you haven't already, because anything that you've sent with 1.0, once it expires after 1.0 goes away, uh, you're going to have to redo in 2.0. We have a couple of webinars coming up next month. And I think the day of 1.0 going away, where we're going to go over just the details of 2.0 and kind of give you some insight into uh, the differences, parity, things like that. Okay. So we have our RPA and we have digital 2.0. We're going to go to the next step. Who are we sending it to? We're going to send it to me. We're going to send it to my client. Now, if you want one of your clients, if you, I'm sorry, if you want your client to receive it first, we can set a signing order and we can use these crosshairs and drag Ricardo up here. So he's number one, or we can make us both number one, or we can take off the signing order completely. If I, if it's just me and one buyer, I usually don't use the signing order. If there's multiple clients that I'm sending it to, I like a signing order just because I want there to be kind of a stop gap. If, if there is a problem, let's talk about some of the, the features we have on this step. Okay. So if we need to add signers, we can do that at this point. If we want to add a reviewer, we can do that. So this is unique to digital link 2.0. A reviewer is someone that is not actually marking the document with a signature or an, or an initial, but they have to review the document and give it that thumbs up before the document can be completed. That reviewer can be put in the first position, second position, third position, any position that you want. So maybe you're a newer, newer agent and you're working with a productivity coach or a mentor of some, of some sort. And maybe they need to be, they, they, you're going to have them as the reviewer set to the, maybe the first position so that they get the contract, they get to look it over. And if it's no good, they're going to nix it. They're going to, they're, they're not going to, you know, approve it. And then they can help you with it. But if they approve it, it'll go on to your client. So again, we're in this remote paperless. We're not using email to send documents back and forth. Uh, this, is a, this is a nice feature, okay? We also have our CC list. So this is similar to the reviewer, but the CC list is simply at the end of the, of the packet when it's complete, if we want to send it to someone that is not a signer, we can CC it to them. So they will get the, the final executed copy. In, in practice, this would be maybe your assistant or your transaction coordinator, um, anybody that needs to receive a copy of the, the signed packet, but they're not actually signing or initialing it, okay? And then we also have our time zone. You want to make sure that your time zone is set correctly. Last thing you want to do, is send something for signature at 9 p.m. on Sunday, and it looks like they signed it at 6 a.m. on Monday. You will be able to deduce when they actually signed it by looking at the time zone, but why would you wanna have to go through that, heart, that headache, okay? So let's click next. It's going to open up, when we get to, to step three, it's gonna open up a new tab, because that's just what AuthentiSign does. And it's going to, prepare the signatures for this packet. Now, because we, we started this from zip and we had our parties set correctly right off the bat, this is going to auto tag the signatures, the dates, the initials, things like that, okay? If this was a PDF, maybe we're the listing side and we receive an offer, you're gonna have to manually tag it. And that can sound uh, daunting, but it really, it's, it's not, if I needed to add my seller signature here, let's just assume that I'm the seller in this, in this scenario, I can click drag and drop. I can drag a signature over here. 
I have two ways of getting the date. There's a little sprocket here. I can say add a date stamp, move it into place, whatever you need to do. If I don't use that sprocket, I can just grab the date from in here and move it down your choice. We have signatures. These are mandatory signatures, optional signatures, mandatory initials, optional initials. We have mandatory checkbox. We have an optional checkbox or we have a radio button. Now a radio button is a, is a yes or no, A or B choice. This is required. One of the two responses is required. Again, we have our date stamp. If we wanna just put our signer's name, we can do that or we can add text. So the drag and drop text, this is text that are that the signer can edit, okay? Drag and drop, this pen, this should tell you that this is, this is things, these are things that the signer are going to interact with, okay? If we needed to add text, let me delete these real quick. If we needed to add text to the form, but we do not want it to be editable, we would use the markup. And this markup text is where we can we can add a text box and put our, put whatever we need to in there. And this is not editable by our client. Ooh, let's move it. Oh, it's a little finicky today. Oh, you don't want to move now. Well, maybe I delete you then. All right, so we have markup text. We can we cannot redact. We can't use the pen tool, but if we want to, we can highlight a certain clause or anything. We can use the sprocket to say, well, I don't want it to be blue. I want it to be red. We really want to call out a, a portion of this document. Okay, so again, it's going to auto tag where the signatures and initials need to be. And then we can hit next. And it's gonna ask us, do you wanna send the invitations just as is, everybody gets the same invitation, or do you wanna customize the invitation, the email and subject for each signer? So if, the, if you want a specific message to go to your client and a specific message to go to, to one of the other signers, you can draft separate emails. It's kind of helpful. Or we can just send the invitations. It's gonna say, thank you for using DigitalLink 2.0. And then you're gonna to have to close that tab and go back to your zip form, okay? So in the meantime, let's see if our, there's our inbox folder, okay? This got, this created itself. We go to our history here, we can see that the document pre-approval version two was received by email from our client. Pretty great. If we open up our inbox folder, we're gonna see the text of the email, who sent it, when it, when was it received, the subject, the full body, it's pretty cool. And then we have the attachment. So now that we have the second version of that pre-approval, we can do something with that now. If we go to our pre-approval here, maybe we want to upload a new version. So we have a couple options here. We can either drag the file out of the inbox or we can click this little blue drop down and say that we want to upload a new version. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna drag this pre-approval up to the general folder here. Grab my pre-approval version two, I'm gonna drag it onto my other pre-approval. And I don't know if you noticed, but see how this is a single page and now this is a stack of documents, this pre-approval is going to act like a folder now. Both of my pre-approvals are in here and you can see that this is the latest version that, 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 that was uploaded. That's pretty helpful. This is keeping us organized. This is gonna act like a folder. I love that, okay? So as we are using this email to transaction, we're gonna have a pretty fantastic communication log. It's gonna show what was said to who and when it's great. That's not, that's an audit trail. That's pretty great. All right. So let's sign this document. So our signature is requested. We're going to click start signing. I'm going to prepare those signature blocks. I'm 
19 pages, including the TOA. See, Rick has used this before, so he's already drawn his signature. Now, he, at this point, he has the, the ability to, to, you know, go through and review if he wants, or he can click start, and it will push him through all of the signatures and, and initials. If you notice, remember, we highlighted this paragraph here. That's what shows up. It's going to show up as a highlight. It's going to go through and just rock all these signatures and initials. And then once he gets down to the liquidated damages and the arbitration, when he clicks on that, it's the, because these are optional, it's going to ask him, do you accept or do you decline? And this is something that you need to coach your clients. Let them know that to be expecting these optional initials. If you are not an attorney, don't tell them, don't give them legal advice about why they should, they, they should choose one of the other options. Direct them to legal counsel. But do your best, do your due diligence and let them know that there are optional initials. If they want more information, they should seek legal counsel, but let them know so that they're not blindsided and say, oh, what am I accepting or declining? They need to know. So they're just gonna rock all these initials. Then we get to the TOA, they have to sign that. They can stay in review if they want or they can complete the signing. And this is great. Now it's gonna ask them once they've, you know, finish their signature. It's going to say, Hey, do you want to, do you want a zip community account? Guess what? Rick already has one. So he's going to sign in. And now he'll be able to see not only that RPA that we provided him, but also this packet that's in progress. Looks like I, as a selling agent still haven't, haven't uh, completed it. No problem. Let's jump into my portion of the signing and finish it up. Let's see, do we have any questions? Looks like we just have the one question of if it's being recorded or not. You guys are so quiet, all 21 of you. So I only have six signing blocks on this. I've already signed before, so my signature is there. I'll just get these signatures out of the way. Boom. Now, even though I'm the agent, it's gonna ask me, do you want a Zip Community account? No, because I have a Zip Form account. Don't sign up for a Zip Community account if, you're, if you are the realtor in this situation. It, just, it asks everybody. All right, so now that we have signed this, we'll give it a minute for those final documents to come through. All right, so we have our pre-approval, we have our proof of funds, we've filled in our checklist, and you see now that we have our date of the contract, this shows up, we don't have our offer date in here. So the summary of the transaction is where a lot of our dates and specifics are gonna be filled in here. And maybe we got our offer accepted tomorrow. Let's jump ahead. And it looks like our signed documents have come through. So let's check that out. But let's let's assume that our, our documents are, I'm sorry, that our, our, uh, our offer got accepted. Looks like we have our signed contract in here. So let's, let's assume that our offer got accepted. Now we need our client to fill out the buyer inspection elections, okay? So I'm going to add the BIE form. And when we open that up, we will see that we don't have the ability to actually fill out this form. So everything's blacked out and it says only editable by buyer one. And how do we get this signed? I know that some of you are probably gonna say, oh, I can send it for signature and they can fill it out then. I don't recommend you sending anything to your client to fill out via digital signature. They're going to make a mistake more than likely. They don't do this every day. We do. We're the professional in this situation and we need to uh, mitigate that risk and make sure that we are giving our clients an effective way to fill out the TDS, the SBQ, the BIE, the ESD form, if that's applicable, the lead form, if that's applicable. We need to give them a secure and encrypted 
hint, hint, way to fill this out. So I'm going to provide my client with the ability. See how this one's blue? Because there's an active share. We're going to take that a step further. So I'm going to remove that RPA. And I'm going to give them the buyer inspection elections. And I'm going to allow them to edit. I'm going to send them a new email and say, let's use my dictation to, for speed. Please fill out this form. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. And send them a new email. I'm on a Mac. That's why I have the dictation. Your computer probably has dictation too. All right. So our client got another email from us with our little message here. They're going to click view documents. And again, they're going to sign in. Obviously, they're not doing this all within an hour, so they're, they will have to sign in. Now we have our listing date, our offer date. We have our offer acceptance date, a couple more items on the calendar. Let's go to documents now. We have our buyer inspection election. But the difference now is that when they open up that form, rather than, rather than it being a PDF preview, this looks a lot like our zip form, right? We've given them very limited permission-based editing privileges. So they can now fill out this form. They're going to get a home inspection. They want to get electrical. They're going to get plumbing, uh, probably a roof, sewer. I think I wanted asbestos, methane, and mold. And that's, and that's good for them. That's all they really need. So they let us know, hey, we, uh, we filled out our buyer inspection election. You say, oh, great. You go into your zip. We're going to open up our BIE form and we're going to take a look at their responses because we've given them, we've separated the two steps of filling out the form and getting it signed. We've, we've separated the two. Okay. So when, now, when we preview that form, we're going to see all of their responses. And the reason why this is so powerful is because again, your client's probably going to make a mistake on that TDS and the SBQ, and then you're going to have to send it again. And your client's probably not going to use you again. If you make them fill out the SBQ or the TDS twice, it's tedious. Okay. If you do it this way, you as the professional, as the agent, as the one that has the duty to serve, you have the ability to review the document. Okay. So I can see here that they didn't check wood destroying pests. I know for a fact, we talked about it, that they wanted a termite inspection. So I call my client, email my client and say, Hey, um, you wanted a termite inspection, right? And they say, yeah, did I not check that? No, you didn't check that. Oh, no problem. They go in there. They check wood destroying pests. We go back in and open it up. And that response has now been registered. It's been recorded. Now that we, as the professional, again, have verified that the document is complete and that it's accurate. Now we can send it for signature. This is important, okay? In this, in this time where we're remote or we're dealing with clients that are out of state or out of the area, you need to give your clients an effective way to fill things out, to get things done. So, so far we've been able to provide our clients secure encrypted access to the document before signing it. We gave them a secure and encrypted portal to upload sensitive documents. We've given them a secure and encrypted portal to fill out disclosures. This works. It's effective. It works. And at this point, the, the client can, can download it. They can do whatever they want with it. But we have the ultimate control over everything, right? So now we can send it for signature. So I think we see a question here. Uh, someone asked, how is the automated signature process monitored for pending signatures? I don't really know what you're asking there. Your first question was, is the application updated in Zipform mobile? Uh, so everything you do in Zipform here will show up in the mobile app and, and vice versa. Everything you do in the mobile app is going to show up on your, your online version of Zipform as well. You're, when you're in Zipform mobile, you're just in a mobile optimized view 
of your Zipform account. They're not mutually exclusive. They're, they're the same account. They're just accessed from different points. All right, so that is that part of it. And then we said we were gonna go over adding photos to the forms. If there's no other questions on what we've gone, gone, gone over so far, let's do a little review. So we talked about templates. We talked about organization. My listing template has a series of folders, series of documents. We have some document placeholders. My purchase template, far less organization because we were built for speed. Once we've, once we've applied our template to a transaction, we can use Zip Community to allow our clients to upload their proof of funds and their pre-approval. Our placeholders can be stacked on one another. Our CAR forms themselves have smart form features like the TOA, the text overflow addendum that, that will automatically attach when we overflow a text field, very, very helpful. We talked about email to transaction and fax to transaction that you can get documents and communications directly into your transaction using this unique email. We got our RPA signed, we got our offer accepted, and then we had our client fill out the BIE via Zip Community. Now, one of the good things about having this signed, I'm sorry, having this filled out with Zip Community is that it doesn't matter what signature platform you end up using. Zip Community is the filling out portion, it has nothing to do with the signature portion. So if you are a DocuSign user, you can still use Zip Community to get things filled out. If you use Digital Ink, even better, you can still use Zip Community to get things filled out. It's pretty helpful. So now that we have our offer accepted, we've got our BIE, maybe we're doing our physical inspection and we as the agent are gonna be filling out our AVID. So I'm gonna grab my AVID and I, and again, I can be do this, I can be doing this on my mobile app or I could be doing it on a tablet or have maybe a laptop that like a yoga laptop that, that converts into a tablet type of interface. But as I'm filling out my AVID, you know, pictures worth a thousand words, maybe in the dining room, there is a large chandelier, a chandelier. I can't spell chandelier today. There's a large chandelier. Now that's helpful to know that there's a large chandelier, right? But wouldn't it be better if we had a photo of it? Well, we can do that. If we go up to the photos here, click attach photo. It's in my listing photos, I believe. I have this picture of a chandelier and we have a spot for a caption. So again, not telling you what to say in your caption, but maybe you can say large chandelier comma looks very hard to clean period. I hope they own a tall ladder. Again, you're not going to write a description or a caption like that. I'm just showing you functionality. So it's going to drop this photo tag, right? And we can put it wherever we want to go. Maybe we want to put it right there next to the text. That's fine. So now using our preview again, PDF preview, how many pages is the Avid? Oh, three, right? But if we preview it, guess what? It's four pages now. If we go down to our large chandelier and then we have a little tag for our photo. If we go down to the bottom, there's our chandelier and there's our caption, our, our snarky cheeky caption. So this is a large photo, but again, we're paperless. Doesn't matter how big the photo is because we're not printing it out. Let it be big. Your phones take enormous photos. I mean, the photos will literally take up the whole page. That's fine. Let it be. I carried around a flexible, you know, fold in half kind of six inch ruler. When I did my Avid, if I saw a scratch on the wall, hold the ruler up, snap a photo of my phone. Now I have some size reference. Again, you're not an inspector. Don't say that it's a, you know, sheetrock crack that looks moldy. You know, don't, don't say stuff like that. But if you're going to call out a mark on the floor, mark on the entryway, or, you know, uh, a, a hole in the wall or a paint chip, take a photo of it. Use, use the, use the technology that you have in your pocket and 
add photos to your Avid. I received an Avid once it was 13 pages because it had so many photos in it. And it was really nice. If you're taking a listing and there's a big, you know, obnoxious chandelier that's not included in the sale, take a photo of it, put it in the listing agreement. If you're doing a request for repairs and there's specific things that you want fixed, take photos of it and put the photos in the request for repairs. Every CAR form allows photos, all of them. Use photos. It's very, very helpful. Picture's worth a thousand words, okay? And you can, you can add the photo and the thousand words. Isn't that fantastic? Okay. So that's our time. We got about four minutes left. Um, I'm guessing that you'll get a copy of this recording or it'll be accessible to you. Uh, I'll stick around for another couple minutes if there's questions that, that people want to ask, but I do appreciate all of you sticking around. Looks like we, looks like we lost one. We're at 20 people right now. That's fine. People got stuff to do. You guys are busy realtors. Well, thank you. I appreciate all of you. All right. That's my time. Thanks guys for uh, sticking around. I don't know if you, if we're being signed off by North, North San Diego or uh, if I'm just leaving. All right, guys, that's my time. I'll see you guys. Oh, someone asked a question. How, how do we upload a file? Okay, let's talk about that. So if I want to upload a, a document directly into my transaction, maybe I didn't want to email it to the transaction. No problem. Click add doc, click browse for a document. And we can grab our PDF if we want to throw that PDF in there. So if you're on an iPhone, you have options. You can use your iCloud library. Um, you can use Dropbox, Google Drive. What are the other ones? You can use Box, you can use OneDrive. You have options to upload files. Totally works. Zip form shows up as one of your open in on the iPhone for most files, PDFs and things like that. Yeah, that's how to do that. Okay, if it hasn't been working, um, let's, uh, I'll contact you offline and we'll talk about it. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. You guys are fantastic. Bye.